everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a job for me. <laughs> Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Uh, yes, here we are, and everything old is new again, and we are joined again this week by one of our fast-approaching favorite guests, if you will, uh, Mr. Kevin Burns, who's the driving force behind Ancient Aliens, The Curse of Oak Island, The Curse of Civil War Gold, the new Netflix Lost in Space, and now the new History Channel show Unexplained with William Shatner. Uh, last week we were talking about uh, uh, the monsters with Kevin Burns and talking about an idea that he is the foremost collector of monster memorabilia. How did you get into that, and how did you get into the monsters? Well, I, you know, I was a, as a little kid growing up, um, I was totally fascinated by visual stuff. I mean, the first movie I remember seeing was Walt Disney's Sleeping Beauty, uh, and that blew me away because it was in color. Of course, television was black and white, so seeing things in color. And I, and I loved Popeye. I loved the Flintstones. I used to draw all the time. I used to draw, you know, things I see on television. And then uh, a, a little girlfriend of mine, actually the girl who lived near me, we may have mentioned her before, Nancy Wilbur, whose dad was a TV writer, and he wrote Lost in Space, and he wrote uh, a lot of different TV shows. But she bought me for my ninth birthday a monster model, and I didn't know who monsters were. I didn't know what they were. This was the summer of 1964, and uh, but it was a customizing kit. It had a vulture and a mad dog and a skull. But in the instructions, it said, collect all these other monster kits, Dracula, Wolfman, Frankenstein. I didn't know what they were. I'd never heard of them before. But I did a deep dive in the summer of 1964 and became a total monster geek. And then, of course, I heard the Munsters was coming on. And the Munsters, as opposed to the Addams Family, which I was a fan of the Addams Family, but the Munsters to me was special because they were the original Universal Monsters, and it was it was Frankenstein and Dracula, even though they were funny. So then I started drawing the Munsters, uh, like morning, noon, and night, I would draw the Munsters. So my mother and father, God bless them, but my mother and father, you know, appreciated what they felt was my talent, but they didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, uh, you know, I was going to Catholic school, which meant that there was absolutely no room for creativity <laughs> and, uh, and so I was just a strange little kid so my mother read an article that said that Fred Gwynn was an artist and he had written an illustrated children's books and he had been the editor of the Harvard Lampoon and he was very well educated And so she said to me maybe you should send your drawings to Fred Gwynn maybe he can give you some advice well I never thought I never would do anything like that you know, the only celebrity I'd ever written to before this was I sent 25 cents and became a member of the Huckleberry Hound fan club. <laughs> really? But the, but the uh, I mean, it shows you what a, what a tender ch- childhood I really had. <laughs> but the, uh, so anyway, I, I reluctantly sent a bunch of my drawings to Fred Quinn. And, uh, you know, in a couple months, I get a postcard back from him. It was one of those studio postcards. But he had personalized it and scratched out Dear Munster Watcher and wrote Dear Kevin and said, P.S., thank you for the very nice drawings. And, it, hmm. uh, and, and that was it. I, that, it was my favorite show. He was my hero. And I would send more drawings and he would send more postcards and draw little pictures on them. And we struck up this correspondence that you know went through the run of the series and extended into my high school years where I, I found, you know, he sent me back a picture with a phone number or a, his address on it in upstate New York. This is after the show went off the air. And, uh, and I found he was listed in the directory, so I called him on the phone when I was 16. I was, no, I was still this kind of geek, but, you know, I'm talking to Fred Gwynn when I was 16 years old. And, and I, I remember the conversation like it was yesterday because I was so nervous. And I was like, "Hello, uh, hello!" My voice was cracking, <laughs> and, he was, and he and he had this very kind of, yes. And I said, uh, um, "Is this uh, Fred Quinn?" Uh, yes. Uh, this is Kevin Byrne. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 
I, I, I'm the guy who sent you the drawings. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> did you, did you, I got the drawing you sent me. I wanted to say thank you. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, and then I'm, and then I'm out of ammunition. Right. I have, and I have nothing else to say. So I say, um, so are is everything okay? <laughs> and he's like, uh, and, uh, like uh, yes. And I said, um, well, um, listen, I, I'm I'm going to be playing you in a haunted house oh, this God. fall. Uh, and he said, oh well, that's very. Uh, well, scare the hell out of them. Uh, you know, have fun, have fun, scare the hell out of them. And I said, and then I said the dumbest thing I could think to say, which was, what's the matter? You don't like kids? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and he said, and he said, no, no, they're, 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 they're little people. <laughs> they're little people. And he said, but just, uh, just scare the hell out of them. Have some fun. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, Mr. Gwynn, thank you. And he said, uh, you're very welcome. And that was it. And, and, I, and of course, I, I remember this conversation verbatim because, yeah. of course, I was kicking myself for the next several years. I did meet him uh, in person, a friend of mine, when I was in Boston. Wow. And, I had one, and I was teaching film school at Boston University. I had got my graduate degree there. Uh, I had won uh, several awards for this first film that I had done. And so, um, and a friend of mine who was a reporter and critic for the Boston Herald was doing an interview with him and he, and, uh, and a review of the play that he was in, uh, called Who Done It? Uh, and, uh, so he invited me to come to watch the play with him and then be with him when he did the interview. Well, this huh. was huge. <laughs> and I, and, and, and not since my, my creepy phone call that I had, I had any contact. So I, I went to the play and I drew this caricature of him in the character that he did in the play. And I cut, painted it and I matted it and I framed it. And the next morning uh, we go to the uh, Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston and Fred comes down wearing vintage uh, uh, Brooks Brothers. He was in canary yellow pants and this uh, check jacket and very preppy, and he had this, God bless him, you know, I saw him in person for the first time, he had this enormous head, and uh, the tall man, big head, he looked a bit hungover, I have to say, <laughs> and, and we sat and had breakfast, and uh, he ordered Eggs Benedict, and I gave him this caricature I drew, and he could not have been more blown away and more nicer and more, more gracious about it, he kept looking at it, you know, really from the standpoint of an artist. I was huh. so honored. And he didn't know who I was. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he, he heard my name, but it didn't register. And I didn't say a word. And, and, um, and I was very quiet. He was very grateful about the picture. So we put it in the fourth chair. So we're sitting. And he ordered, as I said, Eggs Benedict. And we're having breakfast. And he kept looking at the picture and saying, how did you get that color? And how did you get that texture? And, and he's, but so my friend Nat Segaloff was doing this interview, and at one point the conversation turned to the Munsters. And this was 1982, after he had done the Munsters' Revenge TV movie, and he was totally open to talking about the Munsters and Al Lewis and everything. And uh, and uh, but I was trying not to be a fanboy geek, and I sat there, you know, just totally excited, but poker face. And at one point Nat said, "Well, Fred, how many episodes of the Munsters were there?" And he goes, uh, let's see, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm not sure. And I said, I blurted out, you know, 70. <laughs> and he looks at me, and his eyes narrow, these pale blue eyes, and he says, that's right, how do you know that? <laughs> and that then outed me, he goes, well, you don't know this, but you have a relationship with Kevin that goes back quite a while. <laughs> and I told him the story of the drawings and the postcards and I'm thinking he has no memory of this and I said and uh, I said I used to call you on the phone and 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 he, and he and I said you're actually the reason I'm in this business and he said oh that's very kind of you but I don't believe a word of it <laughs> uh, you know he, he was he was very self-deprecating right and I, I I said no I said seriously you were a huge inspiration to me and you gave me the courage to pursue this career. 
uh, that contact meant so much. And he was like, well, well, that's very sweet of you, but, you know, I, I don't buy And But then about, four, I swear, you know, because at that point he still didn't, it didn't click. And then all of a sudden he looked at me about a minute later and he goes, I remember you. I'll be damned. I remember you. I'll be damned. And, and it was, and I wasn't sure if he did or not. It didn't really matter to me. It was the most magic moment of my life. And of course, we have to stop right there just a minute. We'll be back right after this and everything old is new again. Talk about the Munsters and Fred Gwynn and more with Kevin Burns on Everything Old is New Again. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Eddie, the lesson I want you to learn is it doesn't matter what you look like. You can be tall or short or fat or thin or ugly or handsome like your father. (laughs) Uh, You can be black or yellow or white. It doesn't matter. What does matter is the size of your heart and the strength of your character. Oh, there we go. We're back here on Everything Old is New Again, and that's just a little piece of and an example of Fred Gwynn as Herman Munster in The Munsters. If you haven't seen that show, uh, YouTube's got it, I'm pretty sure, and uh, Hulu, so take a look for that. It really was a fun show, a lot of, a lot of uh, laughs and a little bit of... I don't know, something behind the scenes, a little little more to it than just some laughs, good family fun. Here on Everything Old is New Again, we're bringing that up because we're embroiled in a bit of a distort discussion here and a nice story of the introduction of Fred Gwynn to Kevin Burns as a child. I mean, that was some event, the most uh, magical moment of someone's life, that's for sure, especially when you're young. So we'll get to that story in a minute uh, here with Kevin Burns on Everything Old is New Again with uh, David Cohen and Douglas Viviani. And by the way, uh, Kevin Burns is not just an aficionado of the Munsters, of course. He's the driving force, the producer, and sometimes writer-director of some of these shows, all of these shows, Ancient Aliens, The Curse of Oak Island, The Curse of Civil War Gold, the new Netflix, Lost in Space, which we spoke about and we'll talk about again uh, with Kevin Burns. Further, there's a new show on the History Channel, Friday nights at 10, Unexplained with William Shatner. Uh, of course, everybody who listens to this show knows that Star Trek is a um, mainstay in, in this show. There's always a reference. There's our reference there. And we had a whole discussion last week on Everything Old is New Again with Kevin Burns about the behind-the-scenes activities and personality of William Shatner. And if you need to look to that because you want to hear that and you haven't heard it before, uh, go to our website at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. That's everythingoldisnewagain.biz. And you can readily access the interview we had last week. And that would be show like 274, I believe, or 275 with Kevin Burns. And or go to YouTube. Take a look for YouTube. Uh, dot com, of course, and you go to Everything Old is New Again radio show, and you will see all 175 shows listed therein, uh, and just click on one, and uh, and you can listen to any old show uh, that we've had that's already been broadcast, and uh, if you want to communicate with us, feel free to do so, old new again at AOL.com, that's old new again at AOL.com. We'll be more than happy to talk with you, share ideas, have some fun with uh, maybe uh, having you present to us a show idea that maybe we'll uh, dive into one week. And if we do, maybe we'll have you on as a guest. That would be cool. Or maybe if there's a local event that you want to bring a microphone to, which everyone has in their cell phones now, and interview someone or just uh, walk around and tell us what's happening, a local comic book or pop culture event, uh, we would be happy to um, have you as a guest on the show, maybe to discuss your experience if there was something interesting, funny, uh, weird, something that occurred uh, that we can share uh, with everyone here on Everything Old is New Again Nation, if you will. And uh, we've got some great upcoming shows coming up. Uh, feel free to contact any 
and all radio stations in your area that are carrying our show and compliment them for carrying everything old is new again. And the alternative, if you have, uh, you know, listened to us through the Internet because you can't get the show locally and you're then therefore behind because only the old shows are listed on the Internet. Feel free to contact your local talk radio station uh, by email, by telephone, over and over again, and have them contact Everything Old is Do Again uh, to have our show listed on their weekend or even weekday uh, schedule and uh, make it appointment radio. We have a lot of fun here. And Everything Old is Do Again with David Cohen, Douglas Viviani. Now let's continue with Kevin Burns uh, getting into a little more of the discussion of of uh, all things Fred Gwynn and uh, how you were introduced as a child uh, to this gentleman uh, further where it went from there and uh, how your collection uh, continued to grow through the years and then we'll continue to talk about Unexplained and some other uh, activities and shows that you are producing at present and maybe produce in the future. Kevin Burns. Uh, You know, it was the most magic moment of my life and he gave me his home address and his phone number and he invited me to come and visit with him in New York. And I, I didn't really take him up on it. I mean, I have to say, I have met and worked with and befriended and hired every, every idol I ever had as a kid. But I never, you know, I've, I've been very blessed in that way. But I never, and I became very close, by the way, with Al Lewis and Yvonne DiCarlo and Bush Patrick and Pat Priest. But I never pursued that relationship with Fred because it was way too special for me. It was way too important to me uh, to ever have that incredible moment uh, challenged. I, I did run into him a couple of years later. His daughter went to Boston University, his daughter uh, 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 Madden, and, uh, and he was at the he went to the graduation and I was in the faculty. And so, you know, I come up to him in my faculty robes at the time, and we chatted a little bit. We talked about how Al Lewis had opened a restaurant in New York, uh, and it was very pleasant, but but nothing was as special as that uh, breakfast in Boston. Uh, and that's a memory I'll never, ever, ever forget. That's amazing, amazing stuff. And since then, you've, you've collected and collected and collected, right? And am I getting this right, where they're basically categorizing your collection as the collection of memorabilia from the Monsters TV show? Well, I, I have to admit, I have a, a rival. Uh, you know, there's a buddy of mine in uh, Pittsburgh. I met him through collecting, uh, Tony Greco, who has a huge collection. And he has a couple of pieces, I admit, that I don't have. Uh, but I've got quite a few pieces, God bless me, that he doesn't have. And, uh, uh, and he, he tends to collect volume, Tony. I tend to argue that I collect, you know, quantity. I'm, I'm, I'm very much fanatical about condition and, but I'm a completist. And, and so I try to go after all the toys that came out in the 1964 to 66 when the show was on. And, and I keep up with, I mean, like, like recently, for example, I'll admit this as a, Find of my craziness. <laughs> uh, this company uh, in Chicago, Stern, a pinball company, they came out with four different Munsters pinball games. I had to buy all four of them. I have <laughs> five different slot machines, even though it's not technically legal to own them yet until right. they get to be 25 years old. I have five Munster slot machines. I, I, I have uh, Yvonne DiCarlo gave me the bat necklace that she wore for most of the two seasons uh, and through Munster Go Home and the movies. Um, uh, I have Fred's boots for Munster's Revenge. I have his headpiece and wig mm. for Munster's Revenge. I have a headpiece from the original show. I've got the grandpa's electric chair. I've got, you know, Eddie's costumes from Munster Go Home and from the series. So, um, I mean, but I, you know, I have all the paintings and all the artwork for all the games and puzzles and uh, coloring books. So I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm real hardcore when it comes to the monsters. It was, it was very, very, very much, uh, you know, the, the seminal show that, and it influenced me in many ways. I mean, uh, again, I often say the three shows that I loved as a kid were the Munsters, Lost in Space, and Batman. And I never stopped loving those shows. And, and added to that, I have to say, Although I came to it when I was more in high school than when it was on the first run, was 
Star Trek. And so working with Shatner on the Unexplained is a tremendous honor. Yeah, you're living a dream come true as a, from a kid in the 60s, that's for sure. And uh, well, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the happiest 14-year-old kid. Uh, I'm quite a bit older now, but I but I, I but but uh, but every dream I had when I was 10, 12, 14 years old, trust me, I I have no complaints. And we're living them vicariously through you as well, and sharing us uh, these stories on Everything Old is New Again is great. Uh, we'll be back with Kevin Burns, uh, creator and producer of over a thousand hours of television, including uh, Lost in Space, the new Lost in Space season two, coming out eventually, uh, probably within the next year or so. We'll talk about that. And as well as uh, Curse of Ark Island, Ancient Aliens, uh, Curse of Civil War Gold, and the new Unexplained with William Shatner. We'll be back right after this and everything old is new again. Now, back to America's entertainment pop culture talk show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. There had to be some exciting uh, time for you. Oh, it really, it really was. It was a wonderful show. I thoroughly enjoyed my tenure there. That's uh, Lee Merriweather on Everything Old is New Again from the Past. Uh, David Cohen, Douglas Viviani. We're here enjoying a uh, discussion with Kevin Burns, who's responsible for more television than you could ever imagine at this point. Ancient Aliens, Curse of Oak Island, Curse of the Civil War, uh, Gold, the new Netflix, Lost in Space, the new, new, new History Channel show, Unexplained. That was Lee Merriweather talking about time tunnel and i bring that up because uh kevin has a connection with uh erwin uh, allen who was the producer of time tunnel as well and uh, well first of all welcome back kevin thank you for your time well you're more than welcome thank you uh, great i have a little bit of a quiz here for you and the audience i'm going to play one two three four right in a row little clips of s theme songs Let's see if you could recognize uh, which show is which here, and then we'll dive into a little discussion about these. Let's see if we can stump uh, Kevin Burns on that. It, it, you know, it, uh, you're going to have to work a lot harder than that. I know, I know. So it's, it's just a way uh, to introduce this topic, see. but let's, let's see. Let's see. The time, the time Tunnel theme by John Williams. Yep. Lost in Space Season 3 theme by John Williams. Yep. Uh, the uh, Land of the Giants Season 1 theme by John Williams. Uh, then it was the Poseidon Adventure, if you thought you were going to trip me up with that. I did. Um, <laughs> and that was also by John Williams. Yep. And then the last one was Paul Sautel, who, uh, his theme for Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. See, that we're never, ever going to be able to, to stump you, but I figured it was a good way to get into a discussion of... Uh, well, the first thing is John Williams. Isn't that amazing? Uh, he, he's a gentleman that, if you don't know, he's got 51 Academy Award nominations, five Academy Awards he won, 24 Grammys. Uh, he's worked with Spielberg on many, many, many of his movies and started out in the 60s with some of our favorite shows, huh? Well, I, you know, I actually found he, his career goes back even farther than that mm. because being a Munster geek, I have this record album of songs that all have the color blue as a kind of a theme. Uh, it's a record album recorded by Ivan DiCarlo. Um, <laughs> and it's called Ivan DiCarlo Sings. And it was recorded, I'm going to guess, around 19... 58, 59, maybe 1960, and it says conducted, uh, orchestra conducted by John Towner. Well, it mm. turns out John Towner was an early name used by, professionally by John Williams. Huh. Mm. His real name is John Towner Williams, and he had started out as a jazz musician, but he would also work as an arranger conductor um, for, you know, pop music. And 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 when in his early career, he's probably only in his twenties. He 
probably hadn't settled on what name he was going to use, or maybe he was working, you know, moonlighting in some way. But anyway, John Towner really goes back that far. I was blown away that he did that too. Uh, and then, uh, and then he did a lot of television, a lot of early TV, uh, and uh, and then found himself working with Irwin Allen, uh, particularly uh, or starting on Lost in Space, and then worked with Irwin nonstop. Uh, uh, did all the key tracks for Lost in Space. Uh, he only, you know, he only scored, um, I think, four episodes of season one. But they used those four episode scores over and over and over and over throughout all three years. And then, of course, he did the, all the key tracks for the Time Tunnel. He did the key tracks for uh, Land of the Giants. Um, uh, didn't do anything on Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea that I'm aware of, but then worked with Irwin on uh, the Poseidon Adventure and the Towering Inferno. Uh, he also did Earthquake, even though Irwin Allen did not do Earthquake. Wow. Uh, and there's a, uh, the people at La La Land uh, who I've worked with to produce like the the ultimate box set on all the Lost in Space music, uh, and I've worked with them on all the music from Land of the Giants. They just came out with that. They're also about to do a box set on the disaster movie scores of John Williams, and it's going to have the Time Tunnel, I'm sorry, the uh, Poseidon Adventure, Tower and Inferno, and Earthquake, uh, hmm. uh, because he did all three of those scores. And it turned out, in Irwin's vault, we found a kind of a reel-to-reel mono protection copy of the scoring session for the Poseidon Adventure. I'm sorry, for the Towering Inferno. And for the Towering Inferno. And uh, and it turned out to be a number of the tracks we found were the tracks that had been missing for years uh, thwarting efforts to do a comprehensive Towering Inferno soundtrack. So that's going to be part of that. So I'm very excited about that. Wow, that's unbelievable. And prolific is, is not even the, the word. To, it's too too shallow a word for John Williams and, and what he's done. It's just amazing stuff. And along those lines, same thing with Irwin Allen now. Uh, we know, but maybe this, someone listening is not caught up with us, that, that you have a connection now with the Irwin Allen estate and some of these projects, if not all of the works that, that he was involved with, correct? Well, that, that goes back quite a while. I mean, I, you know, I, what, my first job in Hollywood was, uh, to work in marketing for uh, and promotion for the syndication division of 20th Century Fox. Well, you know, uh, obviously they had Planet of the Apes and they had uh, all the great movies like Alien and Star Wars, uh, and uh, uh, but they also had done Batman and Lost in Space and all the Irwin Allen shows. So I, you know, worked with them, and it developed. It, it, and uh, I, I did speak to Irwin on one occasion. Uh, in my capacity in, in the marketing department, but um, but it led to a friendship with his widow Sheila, and then in 1999, a partner and I, uh, another former Fox executive, John Jashney, he and I were then so close to Sheila that, and she was not pleased with the way the Lost in Space movie had gone down. Um, you know, she she was frustrated by that experience. So we formed a company, John and I did, called Synthesis Entertainment, where we worked with Sheila and basically managed and represented and developed any remakes or sequels for any of the Irwin Allen properties. And even though she passed away a couple of years ago, uh, that relationship has extended and, and will for at least the next several years, where we are kind of the caretakers of Irwin Allen's legacy and so we we develop and produce anything new on Irwin Allen. Uh, we have a major, major book coming out, which was a dream of mine 25 years ago, called The Fantasy Worlds of Irwin Allen. It's a 600-page book that, mm. uh, that uh, Taylor White and Creature Features has published. Uh, Jeff Bond, who does the liner notes for a lot of these soundtrack albums, he did The Lost in Space, and... And, and uh, Land of the Giant soundtrack album liner notes. But Jeff wrote the book because he's a huge, huge Irwin Allen fan. Uh, that's coming out literally in a couple of weeks. But it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. It's filled with all the things we found in Irwin's archives, which finally have a place to, to be seen uh, through this book. Um, but the, the soundtrack album, all this stuff, 
we, we are, we've been so activist at remastering Irwin's properties, uh, putting Lost in Space uh, in high definition, putting it out on Blu-ray, putting it out on HD. Um, I can announce that Hulu, which had licensed Lost in Space, we finally were able to arrange for them to get the brand new masters so that finally when you watch Lost in Space, not only on iTunes and Amazon, but on Hulu, it will look gorgeous the way it's meant to look, you know, and then we, uh, John, who was for a while president of Legendary Pictures, through John, we brought all the Irwin properties into Legendary, and we've been developing with Legendary, uh, you know, all the new adaptations, most significantly and uh, initially, the brand new Lost in Space uh, for Netflix. So we're the executive producers of that, along with the showrunner that we hired, Zach Estrin, uh, Matt Sharpless, and... Uh, or Matt uh, uh, Burke Sharpless and Matt Sazama, uh, who are the writers who wrote the pilot, did an extraordinary job of being the kind of creative architects with Zach of that show, and uh, and that's about to. They've already finished shooting, and they're pretty much through cutting season two, which we've seen, and and that will be premiering in December on Netflix the season two of the new Lost in Space. Nice. Okay, December 2019, obviously, we're saying, right? Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. terrific. And uh, and it's up to the fans whether or not there'll be a season three, although... I think when you see season two, you know there will have to be a season three. Wow, that's great news for all of us Lost in Space fans. The new Netflix show, we of course are here with Kevin Burns, the driving force behind that, and many, many other shows, including Curse of Oak Island and Unexplained with William Shatner here on Everything Old is New Again. We'll be back right after this and to talk more things that are involved with Kevin Burns. And the list continues. It goes on and on and on. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. And we, of course, are joined by Kevin Burns, the driving force behind many shows, including Unexplained on History Channel with William Shatner and Lost in Space. Where we left off with Lost in Space, can you tell us? Uh, well, let's turn to Lost in Space now. Can you tease us a little bit about something about season two, where where we are? We, I know we, they're left and uh, they're off to basically they are now really lost in space. But uh, Well, one of the challenges of the show, I can't tell you any details, but, uh, and I'll probably tell you more than I'm supposed to, but Good. Um, <laughs> just that one of the challenges of doing a show like this is it features kids and the kids grow up. So we, you know, even though there was, uh, you know, a kind of a cliffhanger ending, there was no way, given that we were down for a couple of months, that we were going to be able to bring the show back as if it was the next minute. Because God bless them, uh, Mac, who does Will Robinson, Max Jenkins, uh, who's a wonderful, wonderful kid and a great actor. Uh, they're all really wonderful, I have to say. They're great people. It's a wonderful cast. It's a dream cast. They are perfect in those roles. Parker Posey is, uh, you know, I mean, she is, I mean, Jonathan Harris, who is a very, very good friend of mine, Jonathan would have loved Parker Posey, Parker Posey uh, doing what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And we were careful to not make her really Dr. Smith, because she's acquired the identity of Dr. Smith, who in the original episode, I'm not giving anything away, was played by Bill Mooney, who was so honored to play Dr. Zachary Smith even though it was quite a different character, but, he, you know, Bill Bill is actually Dr. Zachary Smith. Right. But Parker assumes his identity and becomes this kind of twisted version, much more like what Jonathan was doing in the early episodes of season one. But he would have loved her. But anyway, I was going to say that because Max grows, you know, he grows like a stalk of corn, mm. uh, we have had to set the start of season two some seven months later than where you where, than where we left off. So when you watch the new season, it, it won't be surprising, but it, but it takes place seven months after we left off. And so you find out what happened to these characters, not only when we, you know, like in the interim time, but that's where we pick it up. Okay. And uh, the robots with the crew at some point? Can we, can we say that or no? I can't okay. really say, although uh, what I can say is it would be pretty stupid <laughs> not <laughs> exactly. to bring back, not to bring back 
the most popular character of not only the original series, but this new Netflix series. Exactly. So, but when he comes back, how he comes back, and how many robots are in season two, right. I'm not going to say. <laughs> Good. I like to see that. That's great. Because uh, uh, they had a little bit of a breakthrough. If you saw season one uh, at the end of the last episode, and, and so the character might be a smidge different in the in episode two. We'll see. I'm not going to say anything because I don't know anything other than to say that if you haven't seen season one, you got to binge that or watch that at your leisure on Netflix before December 2019 because when, uh, when that drops, you're going to want to watch all those at once. And uh, it's, it's and it's also it's also not that's under by Netflix because they've been a wonderful partner, but it's also on Blu-ray. Ah, um, we we were able to uh, arrange with 20th Century Fox, which of course distributes the original series, to put the original Netflix series first season on Blu-ray and on DVD. And uh, but on the Blu-ray, you get a special treat, which is the original pilot that Irwin Allen did in 1965 called No Place to Hide. And we not only included it with a lot of other bonus extras, but we included it and we colorized it. Mm. So the, the colorized, and it's beautifully done. You know, it's not 100%, I would say, to be totally fussy, but, but it's, it's much better than you would ever expect a colorized black and white show to be. Um, it's, it's beautifully done, and it's, and it's available on the Blu-ray only. Even one of, on the on the Netflix show, and normally I wouldn't hawk it like that, but we're very proud of the way it looks. And I think if you download, you can also download um, the season one on iTunes, and it comes with the colorized uh, Lost in Space pilot, the original Irwin Allen pilot, along with some of the bonus extras. So, so there's a lot of ways you can get a hold of it, but it's really fun. And Bill Mooney and Max Jenkins will become really good friends. Uh, they do they do some surprising stuff in the bonus material, so people should really check that out if you're a fan of Lost Space. It's well worth it, that's for sure. It sounds like it. I, I remember watching those the, that episode, uh, and it's it's one that you don't see all that very often. So uh, colorized too would really make it come to life. That's tremendous. the The other thing I I wanted to say is just to look at a little bit just before we leave here is the voyage to the bottom of the sea. All the other properties, Time Tunnel, in some way, Lost in Space, certainly uh, Poseidon Adventure, maybe not Land of the Giants, but it sounds like you know there's there's a possibility. And of course you're busy, but there's a possibility. Uh, it sounds like you say you're developing or working with. Is there anything on the horizon, at least, you know, a thought going towards any of those projects, especially that voice of the bottom of the sea seems to be something that really would be ripe for, for some development? I don't know. You tell me. Well, you know, we, we, we've been doing that since day one. I mean, in fact, uh, we, we actually had the uh, development rights to Time Tunnel, Land of the Giants, and Voyage before we got the rights back from New Line on Lost in Space. So. Mm. Uh, we, we did develop a, a pilot for a new time tunnel with, with Fox Network. In fact, you, you know, the clip with Lee Merriweather, Lee's become a very, very good friend. She, I've worked with her for years and met with her several times. And they, they're, all these people are very nice. James Darren, Bob Colbert, who were on time tunnel with her, uh, the stars of time tunnel, very nice people. Um, uh, all, all these cast members have become friends. Of course, we've lost. Several of them recently, Deanna Lund recently passed away, and uh, uh, Don Marshall mm-hmm. from Land of the Giant. But the but no, we we've been developing them for a long time. We we had a Voyage movie in development at Fox 2000 for a couple of years with a couple of different writers. Uh, we had a Land of the Giant uh, mini series in development at NBC. A lot of these things, um, you know, they go into development. They take years to play out. Um, and sometimes they're very heartbreaking because they don't follow, they don't come through. Right. But uh, but they are still, you know, are we thinking about it? Are we talking about it all the time? That's great. That's great to hear because I know with you behind it, sooner or later it'll it'll make its way. Especially with the success of, and I think the success, of the upcoming success of uh, continued success, let's say of, of Lost in Space season two. Uh, let's hope that that uh, it just it inspires more people to look into uh, the works of Irwin Allen and things that he's done because it's just so much fun. I have my kids watching them at seven and at ten. I have them watching uh, uh, these episodes, and they, uh, well, they there are also uh, not to, not to yeah. interrupt, but there's also also, we found, you know, we, we have control of Irwin's archive, and there's a lot of really, really intriguing 
um, uh, what are called trunk properties, things that he wasn't able to sell. Hmm. Uh, one, one that we're most interested in is called The Man from the 25th Century, which is a great idea, and there's been quite a lot of interest. But you'd be surprised. I mean, look, Lost in Space, um, we started developing in 2002 when we got the rights. Um, we did a pilot with John Woo, which we were not really happy with. I mean, no reflection on John Woo, but um, but we, you know, but it, it takes a long time for these things to um, to develop them, to play them out, to wait for the rights to come back. Right. Uh, and... And, and and you don't want to do them if you don't do them right. And and so um, you know, so it, it does take a long time. And and as you know, people pick up the book, The Fantasy World of Rowan Allen. There's a lot of information in there about things, uh, projects he wanted to do that he never got to do. Uh, the ones on Edgar Allan Poe and uh, City Beneath the Sea, and uh, just a, a tremendous amount of material. We even found a script. He did a TV movie called The Time Travelers, but his original version of it uh, was a script written by Rod Serling. Huh. And so that's also something we're taking a look at. That's the whole thing. Another aspect of his work to me is that it's timeless as well as we're saying. The kids like the old uh, versions, and uh, they're timeless. Whenever you come out with the Voyage Bottom of the Sea or the Land of the Giants or whatever it might be, Time Tunnel, or, or like I say, some of these others that we don't even know about, um, they they can translate to today's world uh, if done properly, as you've done with Lost in Space, so well that it's uh, it's just a pleasure uh, to watch all of these develop, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show to spend so much time with us we really appreciate it and we look forward to uh, i don't know digging for a little more information on some of the, uh, the other projects as they progress but as of right now listen you got to look friday nights at the very least uh to take a look at unexplained with william shatner at 10 you got ancient aliens right before that uh, coming up soon you got the curse of oak island i guess that's going to be in november uh that's on tuesday nights lost in space coming out uh december 2019 on netflix i mean this goes uh, on and on it's terrific the fantasy world of Irwin Allen, a book that I'm sure you can get in Amazon uh, when it's released in a week or two or whatever it might be, a very short period of time. Hulu, you get the the old Lost in Space, the the, the, the new versions with uh, a very, very clear uh, uh, color and uh, just a, a great time with Kevin Burns. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. If you feel like ever referring anybody uh, else to us, we're always open to interviewing anyone and everyone that's uh, in your cadre here, your seem to uh, have uh, just uh, a real good feel for the pulse of, of our show and what our listeners are looking for and interested in. So, uh, of course, uh, we're always open to that. But on any of, in any event, thank you so much for your time, and we'd love to have you back, as, as always, down the line. We'd uh, just have a great time with you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Well, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Dave. And, uh, and, uh, and thanks to your listeners for their support, because it's uh, very important to everybody. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you want to see these shows? Watch them and uh, and watch them again and spread the word and have others watch them. And, uh, and uh, I, just, I just can't speak enough of how wonderful all these properties are, but this Lost in Space I'm really looking forward to, this Unexplained with, with William Shatner and the new uh, Oak Island. Let's, let's find out what the heck is going on there next season. And, uh, and Ancient Alien is going to continue for years and years, it looks like. So uh, you got to keep me up late uh, late night, uh, many, uh, many a late night with all these shows, but I appreciate it. <laughs> all right, all thank right. you so much. Have a great day appreciate your time thank, thank you, you. Guys. everything old is new again we'll be back next week more pop culture entertainment talk go out with a little theme from lost in space the original season three